Welcome, Paul. It's, it's great to have you. I want to talk about so many interesting parts of your life. I have to say this is probably the closest I've gotten to an actual Beatle, talking to somebody who's spent time with the actual Beatles. Aside from that, I mean, you're, you're an incredibly accomplished filmmaker and, and producer, a lifelong of incredible credits. But of course, you're also a fantastic photographer with incredibly lucky timing. And that's the reason that brings us together today. Uh, so let's begin there, and then we can talk about some of the other parts of your life. But uh, first, my first question is, how exactly did a 20-something Canadian wind up hanging out with the Beatles in India? I, I'll tell you the mechanics of how I got there. It's quite simple. The, 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 the deeper answer is, I think, when we follow our hearts, we get to the right places at the right time, and magic occurs. So I was working in Montreal. I was working at the National Film Board of Canada, I hadn't yet made my first film, but I'd been in television. I was an on-camera host, and I was an interviewer and a researcher in, on television shows. And so I got hired by the National Film Board of Canada. Uh, I thought my life was going great. Uh, I was 23. I was making money. I was driving a sports car. I dated. And uh, I was proud of myself. I'd already done civil rights work in Mississippi, and it was dangerous. And I was proud of myself. Not ego proud. I'm not, that's not my character, but just a sense of healthy pride, you know. I wake up one morning in my little rented room, and I have a shocking thought. There were parts of myself I didn't like. And I was a little shocked. I thought everything was going great. Oops. So without thinking, I said, what do I do? And I heard this deep inner voice, and the voice said this. It said, well, Paul, if you really want to look at yourself more clearly, you might want to get away from the environment you grew up in. And in this odd conversation that was in the flow, I said out loud, where do I go? And that deep inner voice, that soul voice said, India. Now, I had no interest in India. I knew nothing. Meditation, mysticism, I didn't know anything about any of that stuff. But I was so moved by that that I got myself a job working on a film in India to be able to get there because I didn't have the money to buy a ticket. So that's how I got to India. How did you get to the ashram? You know? So I was deeply in love with my girlfriend, Trisha, and she was in love with me. We were both heartbroken by my leaving. We both cried. We didn't want to part. And I, I don't remember what I said. It's, a, you know, it was, a, it was a, its own traumatic time, leaving, parting. So I go to India and I work on the film, traveling across Western India, Rajasthan, from Bombay up through uh, uh, Rajasthan over to Delhi and I get my first mail and I excitedly open a letter from my girlfriend and the first line is, Dear Paul, I've moved in with Henry and I'm devastated. I don't remember anything more of the letter. I was sobbing, I was heartbroken, uh, you know. And somebody I knew for three days in my life, his name is Al Bragg, he's American. I met him in Delhi, don't know how I met him. He said, why don't you try meditation for the heartbreak? And I remember my exact words. I said, I'll try anything. He said, I'm going to hear the Maharishi speak at New Delhi University tonight. Do you want to come? I said, yeah, sure. So I only remember one thing the Maharishi said. So the auditorium is full of probably four or 500 people. We got there late because we got lost. So we're pressed, literally our backs are pressed up against the back wall because all the seats are taken and it's standing room only. And the Maharishi is speaking from the stage. And the only thing I remember was, was he said, meditation takes you beneath and below your daily worries and concerns to a place of inner rejuvenation from which you come back renewed and refreshed. I thought that's what I need. I knew he had an ashram in Rishikesh, and two days later I took a train to Rishikesh. I found it, and I got to the gates. I had to climb up a steep cliff to get to the gates. Um, and uh, they called somebody who could speak English named Raghavendra. He was sort of number three in the Maharishi organization at the ashram. And I told him I've come to learn meditation. He said, I'm sorry the ashram's closed because the Beatles and their wives are here. I didn't even know they were in India. 
And I was already a fan. Their music had already changed my life. In fact, it was their song, Tomorrow Never Knows, that actually was the first key to opening my consciousness. I remember listening to it and they're talking about turn off your mind and float downstream. You are not dying. You are not dying. They're talking about going to the light. And I, and I remember when the song ended and um, I thought, what are they talking about? <laughs> and somehow I had an inner stirring. I knew that what they were talking about was real. I don't know why. I just knew it was real. So he says, I tell him why I'm there. I said, you have to teach me. And I tell him I'm in agony. I probably was crying in that moment because it would bring it all up. He said, I'll go ask the Maharishi. I won't be able to come back for two or three hours, but I'll send you a cup of chai. Beautiful. So he goes away. Uh, a, a bearer from the kitchen staff comes down with this incongruous crockery tray, crockery tea set. I pour the chai, I add sugar, and I sit down with my formal cup of tea, and I just sit down on the dirt path, and I lean up against the front gate, and two or three hours later he comes back, and he says, I'm sorry. The Maharishi says, not at the present time. I said, can I wait? You know, again, I'm not thinking. I'm just speaking from my heart. Can I wait? I didn't know what else to do. I didn't know where else to go. I was, And so I waited, and it ended up, it took eight days. So I waited outside the gate for eight days. So in a way, it was not good news the Beatles were there because I was desperate to get out of the pain. So you finally did get in. You know, what happened that day? Did someone just come for you and say, hey? <laughs> Rog Vendor came out, and it was one of those sort of scenes from a movie. He came out, and in the early, it was very early in the morning. The mist was rising, and he said, okay, it's time to come in. I followed him to a meditation room, and he taught me meditation. It took five minutes, gave me a mantra, and I said, great. And he said... You're now welcome to spend your days in the ashram and take your meals with us. There's no extra bed, so you'll have to stay in the tent. I said, great, and he left me alone. I was in a state of bliss. I came out of the room, and the sun is shining, and I'm in this altered state. I still love Trisha, and it took much longer to get over that. I still wanted to get back together with her, but the agony was gone. And I just walked through the ashram just in this altered state of bliss. Did you just ha casually run into uh, one of the Beatles or, you know, were you kind of intending to also cross paths and find out what they were up to? They're not in my mind at all, period. Um, I'm just so relieved. I'm in bliss, which is a joyful state. I'm looking at the trees. I'm looking at, there's some monkeys, there's some parakeets flying. The ashram's pretty small. I don't know, but I'd say it's sort of like a quarter of a mile by a quarter of a mile. I don't know, about that bit, size. And at one point, I look over to my right, and I see John Lennon sitting at a table over by the edge of the cliff, over by the edge of the... And he's sitting under an arbor. I can see not everything because there's trees. And, and I just found myself curving towards him. And it wasn't a thought. It was just my body was leading the way. And I would say my heart was leading the way. I get about halfway to him, and, and so I'm now about 75 feet, and I re notice that it's Paul McCartney sitting with his back to me and talking with John, and there were other people at the table, and I couldn't see them yet because of the foliage. And I'm about halfway to them, and I realize, oh, my heart's beating faster. And it wasn't, I wasn't caught in it, it was just a noticing. I didn't make anything of it. It's like, oh, my heart's beating faster, but I'm in such a state of grounded calm. So it's not thinking. So I get to the end of the table, and there are the four Beatles and, and their partners, um, and Mike Love of the Beach Boys, Donovan, Mia Farrow, and Mal Evans, their roadie. So there's 12 of them sitting at a long table under the shade, and they're talking, so I don't want to interrupt, and I'm completely calm. They're, it's not thinking, it's just being, and being calm. So I'm standing at the end of the table, and after a moment, they realize somebody's standing there. I didn't interrupt. And John, they pause. Everyone stops talking. And John looks up at me, and I said, may I join you? He said, sure, mate. Pull up a chair. Paul turns to me, because he's on my left. John's on my right. 
Paul turns to me and says, come and sit here, and he moves a chair, and I sit down at the end of the table. And three magical things happen. As soon as I sit down, I hear a scream in my head. Eek! It's the Beatles! That was like a shock to me. And later, of course, in, in, in reviewing it, it's like, well, that was the fan, right? I had seen them live in Toronto in 64. I wasn't screaming anything. I was sitting in, a, in the cheap seats high up trying to hear them. <laughs> you know, like I said, their, their music had already changed my life. We danced to their songs at our, at our gatherings, you know. We, we, uh... So that voice, that scream happens and before I have a chance to think back to the being and the flow as opposed to in the mind I hear my soul talk to me for the second time in my life and it says hey Paul they're just ordinary people like you everyone farts and is afraid in the night <laughs> that's what it said and from that moment on I spent a week hanging out with them and honestly I never thought of them as the Beatles. Never. It never came into my mind. At that moment, the third thing that's magical happens. John turns to me, and in his wonderful, wry, digging wit, he's toying with me. He says, so you're American then, and it isn't a compliment. And I say, no, Canadian. And he turns to the rest of the group and he says, ah, he's from one of the colonies. <laughs> Now, now we're all laughing. And he turns back to me and he says, so you're still worshipping Her Highness then? And I say, no, not personally. And then Ringo and Paul start teasing me about having the Queen on our money. And I say back to them, well, hey, we may have the Queen on our money, but she lives with you guys. So we're all laughing. And it's just being in the flow. It's just being human beings. And that was it. They just took me into their group. I hung out with them for a week. I took out my camera twice. I had lots of film. I just didn't think about it, literally. Um, I took 54 pictures with anyone famous in it, meaning Donovan or Mike Love or, or Mia Farrow and the Beatles and their partners. Um, I had tons of film. I didn't think of it. So, you know, I never thought, oh, I'm hanging out with the Beatles. I could have had autographs and pictures with them. Never thought to ask. And I think that was part of the magic of them taking me into their group. I didn't want anything from them. I came to heal a broken heart. I got it. I got what I came for. The rest was icing on the cake. So I never thought about beetles or autographs. And what I experienced was four remarkably down-to-earth human beings. Remarkable. No ego that I saw in a week. Um, no talking about themselves as anything more than people talk about themselves. No star talk. Uh, I, knew that, I knew that Ringo was meditating because he mentioned it uh, not that long each day. Paul was meditating and both of them were enjoying it. George was more serious about the meditation and longer hours. John, John the same. Of course, depending who you believe in the sense or what information you have, they wrote 48 songs in less than seven weeks. So what happened was they were in an idyllic place without all the demands of daily life and business and home and fans and everything like that. And they were in a meditative state. So the creativity flowed. It's one of the reasons I made the film I made is the, to try and make a, a, a link between the inner creativity and the meditation and the outward product of that creativity. Do you remember vividly any of the songs that they were working on? I was going back to my tent in the middle of the day, actually mid late afternoon, more towards afternoon, and I passed their bungalow and Ringo and John and Paul were sitting on the steps of the bungalow and they were playing their acoustic D Martin D28 guitars and I recognized some fragments and didn't recognize other fragments. They were just fooling around. They were just having fun. So I went to my tent and I got my camera. Thank God I thought of my camera. And I took that shot of John's, which is my personal favorite, where he's just scratching his ear. But the look in his eyes is he's present and he's far away at the same time. It's a beautiful picture. 
and I just got it in focus, right? I wasn't a professional photographer. I was a, I was a yet-to-be filmmaker. I'd worked on other people's films and worked in television, but I hadn't yet made my own first film. And I took pictures all my life because it was enjoyable. It was part of my creativity, but I never did anything with them, and I never, you know, but however. So I took this picture of John, and I took a few pictures through the gate, uh, the, the picture called Perfect Harmony. And I walked through the gate, and they stopped, and John said, hey, Paul, and I said, hi, guys. And I sat down, and they, they were still just fragments of songs. And then Paul, st Paul and John started singing Obudi Obuda, Bra, la, la, How the Life Goes On. And they were repeating it over and over again, and they were playing with it, literally, faster, slower, uh, you know, bending it. It was like just their creativity coming out. And they were in joy. You could see the joy. You know, we use the word play and we forget that it's about joy and actual non-linear play. So I look down, under his toe is a little torn piece of yellow paper. I look over, I'm three feet away. I'm sitting next to Paul. John's on the far side. No, Paul's on the far side. John's between me and Paul. Ringo's to my right. We're like six inches apart. We're just hanging on the steps. And on the little piece of paper, it said, Obwadi, Obwada, bra, la, la, how the life is, goes on. That's all. So they're doing it over and over and over again. Um, they take a break for a moment, just kind of to catch their breath. I take one picture. I lift my camera, and, and I take a picture of Paul. It's called Obwadi. He's looking down at the piece of paper because clearly it was all brand new. They hadn't learned the words yet. And, um, and then they paused and Paul looked up at me just after I snapped the picture and he said, that's all there is so far. We don't have any of the words yet. And then they went back into playing it. So that was the one thing where I, I actually was with them as they were working on a new song. The other experience was that after two or three days, Raghavendra came in the early morning to my tent and said, okay, it's time to come in and meet the Maharishi. I thought, great, because I wanted to talk to him, to ask, to hear. So we go to the Maharishi's bungalow and we take off our sandals outside and we go into a meditation room that's probably the size of a living room, like, like, oh, maybe it was 15 feet by 20 feet, no bigger, might have been smaller. And all there is is futons, white futons, and the light is streaming in the windows on three sides. And we sit down in front of a, a, a low dais platform where the Maharishi would obviously sit when he was doing sessions. And we're waiting for him, and then I hear voices coming, and I hear people taking sandals off, and in comes John, Paul, George, and Ringo, Patty, Patty, George's wife, uh, Cynthia, John's wife, um, Maureen, Ringo's wife, and Jane Asher's Paul's girlfriend. Hi, hi, everyone's really in a delighted state, and they sit down with us. So I'm, I'm right in front of this DS with Raghavendra, and now they're sitting right around us, and I'm, you know, six inches away from George's knee, and we're waiting for the Maharishi. And he comes in, and he's a very great sense of humor. And, you know, he comes in, namaste, and we all go namaste, and he sits down and he sees that George has brought with him a little black tape recorder, you know, the 60s model where you have the buttons on the end, play, rewind, blah, 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 record. And he makes a joke. He says, he says to George, is that a new song or would you like me to recite the Bhagavad Gita, which is a very long book, <laughs> the, the Hindu equivalent of the Bible. So we all laugh and he says, no, it's a new song. And he leans down and he presses the play button. And out of the tape recorder comes a song I've never heard, The Inner Light, which he had just finished before coming to India. He had done the music in Bombay months earlier, but they did the vocals just before coming to India. So he had the first, you know, finished home tape, little cassette. And George starts singing along with it. So out of the tape comes the finished version of The Inner Light, and he's sitting right next to me, and he's singing out loud. So it was magical. It was great. The Maharishi never did notice me, never did speak to me, and, and I, that, but that was like a wonderful, wonderful moment. 
when you heard Oh Blah Dee Blah Da later on, when the song was actually released, did that trigger something in your memory? Um, just the joy of the whole experience, you know, just the wow. And then, of course, I'm listening now to all the words. So, of course, I'm remembering him saying we don't read the words yet. And other than that, you know, just the joy of listening to new Beatles songs on the White Album. I mean, you know, you know, everyone has their favorite album or sort of. I don't because they're all my favorite albums. <laughs> it's like, you know, I sometimes get asked, so do you have a favorite Beatles song? And I got 50 of them. Were there any of the four that you particularly connected with in some way, either, you know, had a long conversation with or felt just a bond, a special bond? Ringo was very dear with me. Uh, one, one quick story about Ringo. He was shooting film on his Bolia wind-up camera, as I remember. I think it was a wind-up camera. And he was shooting film. He came to me one day and he told me, I'm, I'm, we're wanting to make a film about the Maharishi in meditation, which never got made. And he said, but I'm always behind the camera. Can you shoot some film for me for a day or two so I can also be in the film? I said, great. So he showed me how to use it. So I shot film for a couple of days and I gave it all to him. And um, that was great. And he was grateful. And then the next day I was sitting reading under a tree and he came over and he said, here, why don't you shoot this? He gave me a hundred foot uh, closed, you know, virgin box of Kodak color film and his camera. He said, here, why don't you shoot some and keep it for yourself? And he made a joke. He said, you, he said, it might, it might be worth some money one day. So he was being grateful and kind. And I took it and I said to him, that's really lovely, but I don't know why it would ever be worth any money. And so we're laughing, we're playing. So I shot the hundred foot roll of film. When I came home to Toronto, I had it processed. I showed it to a couple of friends. I developed the, the pictures and, and I, I did a magazine article and then I put them away and forgot about them for 32 years. That's another story, but back to there. So that was my experience with Ringo, other than just hanging around and him being a sweetheart. Paul was the most friendly. We didn't have any in-depth conversations, just hanging, but warm and friendly funny. My deeper connections, my more significant connections were John and George. Like I said, there was never any shop talk, but for whatever reason I felt to say, and I said, I love the way you brought the sitar into Norwegian wood and into Beatles music. And he just lit up. And he probably spent 10 minutes telling me how he was introduced to the sitar. He saw it on the set of Help. He picked it up. He started plunking it. He really wanted to learn it. Someone introduced him to Ravi Shankar coming through town. He asked Ravi Shankar to teach him. I think first he got a Ravi Shankar album, but then he saw him live and then he met him. And then he told me how he had spent six months learning the sitar. Uh, and then he said, I was just going to go practice. Do you want to come? Very dear. So we go to a small meditation room, his meditation room, and it's tiny, six feet by 10 feet maybe a window that was dusty and the light was filtering in afternoon light and nothing, everything was white. We're wearing white Kadi pajama clothes, the Indian clothes that are the most comfortable clothes on the planet that I know because you feel like you're wearing nothing but you're clothed, right? Light Kadi cotton. Um, and he picks up the sitar and he starts to play and I close my eyes and, and honestly, Raymond, I don't know if he played for 10 minutes or 40 minutes because time shifted something happened and I opened my eyes slowly when I heard the last note fading out and and there was no more note and I slowly opened my eyes I was stoned I was back in that state of bliss I could see the energy in the room and George was putting his sitar down and we had a conversation um, I don't know how long probably half an hour I only remember two things because I didn't go out and write it down I was just you know we're we're just living. I'm not taking notes. And I remember two things he said. He said, I get higher meditating than I ever did on drugs. And I know what he meant. And the other thing he said to me changed my life. Uh, we were both 24 years old. He was a man of profound and genuine humility. And he said these words. He said, like no, with no ego, he said, like we're the Beatles after all, aren't we? We have all the money you could ever dream of. 
We have all the fame you could ever wish for. But it isn't love. It isn't health. It isn't peace inside, is it? <laughs> Changed my life. You know, brings tears to my eyes right now because what a gift and what a thing to realize. Here's this 24-year-old super, super, superstar and what a kind-hearted, beautiful human being. With John, we were sitting out at the table by the cliff. Everyone got up to leave. John and I were sitting across from each other, having a cup of chai. And he looked up at me. He was writing in his uh, notebook. He was writing a song. And, and he looked up at me and in a very kind voice, he said, so what are you doing here? Because no one was allowed in, right? But it was a very kind, it was an interest in me as a human being. And I said, meditation, heartbreak, the miracle of learning meditation. And he, he looked off in the distance for a second and he looked it back at me and he said, ah, yes, love can be very tough on us sometimes, can't it? And I said, yes. You know, we were just sitting quietly, saying very little. And he looked away in the distance again, and then he looked back at me and he said, But you know, Paul, the really great thing about love is you always get another chance. He couldn't have said something more helpful or more kind in that moment, because even though the heartache agony was gone, I was still in love with someone who didn't, who didn't want me. She's living with Henry. So he couldn't have said something more kind. I realized later, when I learned about him and Yoko, I realized he was talking about me and he was talking about himself. So that was, that was a very healing, beautiful moment, like the moment with George was very healing and beautiful. You know, were there any other moments you had with them while you were at the ashram um, you know, that left a mark on you? So when I was leaving, uh, we were all at the table again by the cliff where we would hang out. And I was saying goodbyes, and everyone was like really beautifully warm. You know, lovely meeting you, hope we see you again, same here, that kind of stuff, and really genuine. And so I started to walk away. Mal Evans had gone to call two taxis, one for me and two friends of Donovan that I was happy to take back to Delhi. And the other was for Ringo and Maureen, and Mao was taking them to the airport in Delhi to fly home. So we were all leaving at the same time. So Mao got two taxis. Well, as I'm walking away, John says, Hey, Paul, will you send us some of your pictures? And I turned around and I said, Sure. And Jane Asher right away said, Here, take my home number. If you call Apple, you'll never get through to them. So she gave me her home number. Uh, and then... Six months later, I was working on the first IMAX film, and I was going through London. I didn't have enough money to print color. Color was way expensive to print, so I printed four black and white poster size, like a film poster size, portraits of them, my, my favorite of each individual. They looked phenomenal in black and white. I've never printed them in black and white since, but they look great. And um, called Jane and we met for a cup of tea in Kensington for about a half an hour and it was very dear, she's a lovely person. And I gave her the pictures and she said, I'll pass them on. And I didn't even give her my card or my phone number or anything. And, and it was literally, I can, remember, I can remember the thought. The thought was, this was perfect. And they don't need new friends, their lives are crazy. So I didn't even think of doing that. Um, and so, um, and so she passed them on. Now, when we were leaving, we're just about to get in the taxis, and I say to Ringo, hey, Ringo, how come you're leaving? And he says, we're missing the kids, and Maureen doesn't like the flies. Now, I didn't notice more flies than anywhere else in the world, but she had a, I since read, she had a phobia about bugs, and Ringo had to make sure in the, when they went to bed at night, he had to make sure there was no bugs in the room. I had to check everything to make sure there was no flies or mosquitoes or whatever, whatever. So the, I, the concept that he left because of the food is a half-truth. The half-truth is that he did have stomach troubles, we read, from the age of about six. And he was hospitalized when he was very young, six or eight for a short time, because of the stomach issues. So he brought the now infamous bag full of beans, and Mal told me, 
that one of his first duties every morning was he would go down to the village from the ashram, he'd buy fresh eggs, he'd come up and he'd make Ringo beans and eggs for his breakfast. So, you know, it's a half truth. But when I said, why are you leaving? That wasn't what he said. I wanted to ask a little bit more about the photos themselves, right? So you came back and and you shared them with Jane. Um, But after that, you just sort of put them in a drawer, stored the negatives and forgot about them and what, you know, what well, it's, yeah, it's real. It's really interesting, and it's to me, it's fascinating what happened as well. So, so I came home. I was broke. I didn't have any money. I had been changed by the meditation. I needed to make money, and I had a a, a burning desire because that's me as a storyteller. It's like, hey, hey, everybody, there's this incredible thing, meditation, holy macro. It was magical for me. You know, healing the agony of a heartbreak in 30 minutes, one meditation, whoa. So I wanted to write about it, to tell people. I needed to make money. So the only thing I did with the pictures then was I did an article for Canada's National Magazine. It was a cover story, big picture of the Maharishi, little picture of myself, which, right, that's cool. And I wrote a story that told about it all. You know, the magazine was less interested in meditation. They wanted the pictures because nobody had that. And um, so I did that, and when I finished doing them, uh, doing that article, and I sent it off to the magazine, and it was all done, the, the changes were done, I was putting away the slides. I was literally closing the Kodak yellow boxes, and I was putting an elastic around it, and I was writing India 1968 on it. And I said out loud, because I was noticed I was feeling bad, and I didn't understand it. And I said out loud, why am I feeling one of those moments in the flow? Why am I feeling badly? And I heard my soul talk to me. And it said these words. It says, you're talking about it too soon. You need to let the experience go deeper within you. And so I put them away, and I put them away with the clear thought. And I remember the thought, I don't want to do anything more with these. Years later, long after I found them, I was working with a teacher in consciousness, and he said, sure. He said, the thing is that the subconscious takes things literally. That's how our subconscious works. That's why it's important what you say to yourself in self-talk, right? If we're hard on ourselves, if we're putting ourselves down, we're damaging ourselves. The subconscious hears that and takes it in. So when I said, I don't want to do anything with these, even though it was a thought, it was like, oh, okay. My subconscious absorbed that and said, okay, well, we're not going to do anything more with them. I literally forgot about them for 32 years. My, I married a woman from India years later. Never thought of telling her I met the Beatles in India. I was, I, when, I finally, when I finally decided to do a book after my daughter reminded me of them, and after I showed him the picture, the pictures one night on a screen in our living room, and she, she said at the end of me showing the pictures, you know, and she asked all the normal questions. What were you doing there? What were they like? Blah, blah, blah. And at the end of it all, she said, you know, they're really great, Dad. You should do something with them. And I spent about a week, and I asked my soul, I asked my inner self three or four times, about, well, what do I feel about doing something with them? (laughs) The message I kept getting back was, that would be fun, you know? So that's that's when I did it. So what happened was that I found a publisher in New York through a literary agent who was uh, someone I knew, and I went to India to write the book, and I went because I wanted to go back to the ashram for the first time just to feel it, just to feel it, and then I wanted to go to Kerala, in South India, one of my favorite places in the whole world, and just sit on a beach and literally write the book. Um, And I said to my two best friends, one was a woman and one was a man, I said, I'm going to India. They said, how come you're going to India? I said, I'm going to write a book. Oh, what are you going to write a book about? I'm going to write a book about the Beatles in India. Why are you going to do that? Well, I spent a week with them there in 1968. You never told us that, they said. And and I said, honest to God, I said, didn't I? You know, it was it was literally out of sight, out of mind. I'm curious to hear more about what it felt like for you when you did rediscover the photos, when you did go back to India. Um, you know, what was that like for you as someone you know who had 
grown 30 years as well. I was in joy and I was walking down the river. I was smiling. I couldn't stop smiling. And I got to the ashram and I had hired a young university student as, a, um, as an interpreter. So we get to the ashram and it's totally different. The path I climbed on the cliff had been washed away in a huge storm many years earlier. And um, I didn't know that, we're discovering it. But then we found a path that was lower down and it led to a very formal gateway, stone and arches and, and, uh, and we went through and we climbed up and we came to a wrought iron fence. So it was different. No longer was it the casual, there's a wood picket fence gate and you can walk up to the gate. There was still a gate, but it was much more formal. So there was a, uh, a, a security guard there, a watchman, a night watchman. And I said um, through the interpreter, um, I was here in 1968 when the Beatles were here and I just want to come back and walk around and have a look and maybe do a little meditation. And he said, I'm sorry, the ashram's closed. It was like living it. I burst out laughing out loud. I just burst out laughing because it was like talk about a repeat of 1968. He wouldn't be convinced otherwise because he was doing his job. He did say that the manager of the ashram would be back tomorrow. We said, what time? And the next morning we came back and the manager was a sweetheart. He said, oh, absolutely. What a nice thing you're back. Come in walk around, do anything you like, and he offered us a cup of tea. It was very sweet, and I did a meditation uh, by the edge of the cliff where I had meditated, you know, back how many years? 43 years earlier. You know, in the years since your visit to the ashram, or the original visit to the ashram, have you ever run across any of the Beatles themselves or anyone in their close circle and, and shared anything about the trip, memories or otherwise? One day my phone rings right here in the house, it was 2008, so it was whatever that is, 40 years later, I think, um, 2008. And a woman says, is this Paul Saltzman? Yes. Is this the Paul Saltzman who was in Rishikesh? Yes. Who's this? Like I hadn't done, I hadn't done, um, I'd done my books. But she said um, that she was Paul McCartney's director of his archives. And she said, Paul asked me to call you. Um, and I said, cool. And she said, Paul's going to do a fundraiser with Ringo at the Radio City Music Hall. It's the first time they'll have played together since 1970, the breakup. There'll be Eddie Vedder, Donovan, Cheryl Crow. There'll be a number of people performing. And it's a fundraiser for David Lynch's Meditation Foundation. They teach meditation to... Um, underprivileged children, to inmates incarcerated, to anybody. And the meditation is, that's David Lynch's devotion to meditating as a way of helping others. So she said, Paul is going to sing a song called Cosmically Conscious, and it'll be the second last song of the set. And he'd like to use your pictures and do a slideshow for the back of the stage, like 20 feet high and whatever it was, 60 feet across. Would it be okay for us to use his pictures? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to imitate this. It's fun. Would it be okay to, to use your pictures? Yes. How much will that be? Gratis. Nothing. I wouldn't charge. It's, you know, they were very generous with me or I wouldn't have these pictures. Silence. Beat. Beat. I'm not joking. Beat. Beat. Why does that surprise you? This has never happened before. <laughs> what do you mean? When people hear that it's Paul McCartney, they want a lot of money. Well, I understand, but I only want one thing. I have one condition. What's that? I'd like you to give me a high-resolution copy of the slideshow you create for my, for my um, archive. Great. She offered me two tickets, and for whatever reason, I don't even remember. I had, I was booked for an engagement, and I don't believe you, I don't believe you, you know, take a better offer. I don't believe you go home with a different person from the dance. Right? You know, that's a funny way to put it. But so I didn't go. Um, later, when I was doing this film. I reached out to Paul because I wanted to interview him and Ringo for the film. 
how did meditation impact your life? How did it impact your creativity? The stuff the film is about. I finally got a meeting set up. It took a year. And I was to meet him in Toronto where he was doing two concerts and in the green room before the first concert. And he was about an hour late. There were other people there who were there to see him, arranged to see him, including his elderly auntie who lives in the suburbs of Toronto. Um, and he came in an hour late. He was very apologetic. Sorry, we had a problem with the sound check. He went around the room. I was the last person to see in this circle of people. And he said, I'm really sorry, because he knew I wanted to talk about a film, and I only needed 10, 15 minutes. But he said, let's take a picture, and I have a fun picture with him going, you know, that kind of thing. And he turned to his assistant who was standing beside him, and he said, book him in for tomorrow. Then he went to get ready for the concert, and, and, and me and my partner, she and I stayed for the concert. They gave me two tickets. That was very sweet. So his assistant booked me for 11 o'clock the next day. And then she called me in the morning. I'm really sorry he's delayed. I got five calls till five in the afternoon when she said, I'm really sorry. CNN has just flown in unexpectedly to interview him. He won't be able to see you. I've never been able to reschedule that meeting. It's hard to get to these guys. Um, yeah, so one day, also in the house here, the phone rings, and somebody says, is this Paul Saltzman? Yes, is this the Paul Saltzman who was in Rishikesh? It's really humorous, right? Yes, who's this? Um, I work for Ringo. It was a woman. She said he's being inducted uh, as a solo drummer into the Grammy Hall of Fame. The first time a drummer is being inducted for, as a solo, he was inducted with the Beatles and other drummers with their bands. And, and they're doing a, a um, museum display in the Grammy Museum. He'd like to use some of your pictures. Can we use some of your pictures? Same conversation. Yes, how much will that be? Free on one condition. What's that? You give me two tickets to the opening gathering at the Grammy Museum Hall of Fame, because I'd never even been there. And um, my present partner, uh, Annie, she and I had been going out for about four or five months, so I asked her if she wanted to come. And she was a fan, um, and so we went, and there was the whole investiture, which was on a stage, and we're in the audience, and some famous people were there, and it's really wonderful, honoring Ringo. And afterwards, there's a reception in the actual exhibition museum area where, the, where my pictures and lots of other stuff of his life is up. And it was so... Crowded, no kidding. You're, you're, walk, you're, you're touching shoulders. I'm not joking. So I take Annie's hand and I start to head to Ringo, who's, you know, 30 feet away in a crush of people. The whole room was a crush of people. So I'm going, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, and I'm working my way through. Finally, we get to Ringo. And, and I don't expect these guys to remember me. Their lives are crazy. Just look at how many people were in the room to see him, to say hello. So we get to Ringo, and I put out my hand, and I say, hi, Ringo, Paul Saltzman, the Rishikesh photos, blank, blank. I didn't mind at all. You know, that was cool. I said, I'd like you to meet my sweetheart, Annie. He gives her a big hug, a big hug, and she was delighted. If, let's say, hypothetically, you did have a chance to have another conversation with either of them, um, what would you like to talk about? I would like to talk about what interests me the most, which I think is the most important for me and human beings. How are you feeling? How's life going? Did meditation, do you still meditate? How did it impact your life? Did it impact your creativity? You know, stuff about, you know, you know, what's more important than fame and fortune? What John, what George Harrison said. So I, I would ask them about their lives, basically. That's, that's fantastic. And, and I also, I highly recommend to my audience as well to check out your film that documents your rediscovery of the photos and your, your travel back to India. I think it's also interesting that you went a little bit beyond just the ashram. You also found, I believe, the guy who is Bungalow Bill. 
from the song Bungalow Bill. Can you tell us a little bit about how you tracked him down and, and what that was like? When I started to make the film, somebody said to me, you know, in one of these magic moments, I wonder what ever happened to Bungalow Bill. So I started researching it and I found him and he lives in Hawaii and I got in touch, you know, it took a bit of research, took a bit of digging, but you know, it wasn't, wasn't difficult, he wasn't hiding. Um, in fact, he and his wife run a retreat center there, which does both conferences and meditation retreats. And I'm sitting interviewing him. Was it on the interview? No, it was before the interview. And I said, uh, so have you talked to, do a lot of people come to interview you? No, you're the first one, he says. Wow, I, I was really surprised because his story, as you see in the film, is beautiful. And he's a lovely, lovely man. And his story is, um, it's, what do you call it? His story is archetypical, you know? The young man who's the hunter, but he also loves meditation. And this thing happens and he gives up hunting and he embraces creativity. So he stops shooting animals. He starts photographing them, including for the National Geographic. It's like an archetypical, wonderful story. So that was a real treat, being able to find him and meeting him. Yeah, yeah it's, it's one of the highlights of the film, I would say. One of the surprise highlights. Um, highly recommended. So, you know, beyond the film and beyond the photo books you've released, you also have kind of made it part of your life to share people the joy of India and, um, you know, in some ways recreate your own experience. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Whatever happened when I first landed in India, the first day, whatever it was, a past life, I'm not sure, or whatever. I felt my body open up in a way that I'd never experienced. I felt myself breathe easier. I felt myself relax. My shoulders dropped, you know, when you relax and you, you get rid of all that tension. So India played a very important part in my life. I've been there now. I stopped counting it 60 times. I made five films in India. I married an Indian woman. Uh, it didn't work out. I mean, we were married for 18 years, but I have a wonderful daughter, which who you saw in the film. So India is like a second home to me. So one of the things that's happened is as I brought the pictures out and I started doing gallery shows and Beatles conventions when I was asked to do these things, people would come up and talk to me afterwards or in the gallery and they'd say, you know, what were they like and why were you there? All the normal, interesting questions. One day in Boston at a Beatles fest, and I've got my, I've been invited to show my pictures and have a room and do a slideshow and all that stuff. And a young man, maybe 25, comes in, and I just notice he walks around, he looks at all the pictures, and then he comes over to talk to me. And he says, I've always wanted to go to India, but it scares me. And I said, Why does it scare you? Blah, blah, blah. And at the end of this, he says, Would you ever take anyone? And I said, what a nice idea. It took me two years to find a travel agent I liked and trusted because I'm a, I produce films, I make films, I direct, I know how to arrange a trip, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted somebody else to take care of all the logistics so I could have the joy of leading the journey and sharing everything. And so we, we've done four of these trips. They're, they're really beautiful, they're joyful. I've taken four groups that got interrupted by COVID. Small groups, total of 64 people, so it averages about 16 people a trip. And it's been from 27-year-old, 28-year-old to an 80-year-old. So yeah, it's, it's kind of, I, I sort of say it's my hobby because I'm a filmmaker, but it's a joyful, joyful time. And it's just sharing, just like my storytelling in films, just sharing. If anyone in my audience happens to be interested in that, how can they get more information? Go to my website. Um, you can fill out a form or you can just email me directly. I'm happy to talk to people about it. I love it. It's a, it's a most fun thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, thank you for sharing all of this. You know, it just seems like both you and the four of them encountered India and meditation at a really important juncture in your lives. The most important thing which we say but we don't do often, is about love and about kindness. And it starts with oneself. If you're not kind to yourself, 
you're not going to be kind to others. That's a good way to put it. And I think it's a good place to wrap up as well. Uh, and, you know, I just want to thank you, Paul, uh, for sharing this, this incredible chapter of your life with us. As you mentioned, people can get more information about your book, movie, everything else you've worked on. Um, we barely touched on, you know, the other parts of your incredible career. But check out your website. The link will be down below in the description. Thanks. Thanks for taking the time to chat with us today. My pleasure. It's been lovely. Thank you. Namaste.